Hi there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost, driving south right now on I-75. We're just around Gaylord, a little bit south of Gaylord, where there's as much snow on the ground as we found any place in the lower peninsula, but there's a lot more snow in the UP. We were up there checking on the deer situation. In fact, we found some deer up around Shingleton that were coming up in a backyard and feeding. What an interesting afternoon that was. It was almost like a spring day, but that marked the end of the spring thaw in the UP. The next day, well, what do you have to do to get the weather to change? Send the Michigan Outdoors TV crew out pike fishing. That's what we did. Oh, the wind blew, the temperature dropped, and we picked up about eight inches of snow. But we had an interesting time out there on the ice. We're gonna show you what it's like to go pike spearing, review a report on the UP deer herd, and we're gonna have a fabulous recipe on UP pepper steak, Upper Peninsula venison pepper steak you're gonna enjoy. We have a lot more, so you stay tuned. It's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again at all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. Well, we headed north from the bridge and it looked like spring in the Upper Peninsula. Well, our idea was, Bob, to get up there and, and show the snow and how thick everything is and cold in the winter in the UP. And what did we get but a lot of bare spots, especially on the, on the hillsides and next to the roads. There were quite a few highway deer kills around Holbert. Yeah. And we intended to get some tape there at Holbert of the deer being fed right there around town. but. They weren't there because of the spring thaw, but we did come across some rabbit hunters. Oh, come here. Come here, <laughs> well, we're just headed over to take a look at the deer in Shingleton and over at the Kuzno Wildlife Research Station and happen to find a couple of guys about ready to proceed out for my favorite sport anyway, hunting a snowshoe rabbits. How's it been this season? Well, this season's not been as good as uh, in previous years. We've had a little bit too much snow early. And lately, uh, we've got too much of a crust with a little bit of lack of uh, fresh snow. So we've had uh, we've had some good hunts, but uh, it hasn't been we haven't been quite as successful as we have in the in the past. But we enjoy it. How about rabbit numbers? Up or down? About the same? I we believe it's down a little bit from last year in uh, the various areas that we hunt year after year. Uh, I would say probably three quarters of the areas that we hunt are down from somewhat from last year. Not terribly down, but. We found enough rabbits to uh, get the dogs going anyway. And as we talked to them later, we ran into them later in the afternoon. They did get three rabbits that day. The first problem was to get across the ditch in their snowshoes. <laughs> yeah, that big drainage ditch there. Uh, they had been going up and down for about three miles trying to find one place to Where cross. They could cross it, yeah. Those drainage ditches are interesting. Of course, the poor little hounds uh, would fall through the crust in the snow, sometimes almost disappearing. But these drainage ditches are something to keep your eye on, especially in the spring. Uh, we found in a ditch just past this area uh, an otter. We yeah. thought it was a beaver at first, but an otter. We looked over there and backed up the car, and that's what we saw. <laughs> he just looked around. We thought we'd... He looked at us twice. He popped up close to, closest to the road, swam across, and popped up on the other side, checked us out. And I'm still not sure whether we were watching him or he was watching us. Well, he he didn't show up again. We don't know quite where he went. But there's a tip to keep your eyes open along the sides of the road as we head towards spring because there's going to be a lot of wildlife moving. And this was just one of the drainage ditches along Highway 28. That's right. And we did see an eagle. He saw an eagle closer to me, I think. This is what it looked like driving in on Saturday afternoon to the town of Shingleton, which appears much larger on your map than when you actually get there. But Fred, it's, it's a real pleasant Upper Peninsula town. Oh, it is. The people were just very hospitable. It was, uh, it was really nice to be there. This is the crossroads of Shingleton, and our object here, we checked in town that, that we had heard that somebody was feeding deer in their backyard. So we went up there to check it out, and we found them just north of town. We're walking up to a house here, right outside, just north of Shingleton. We're only about a half mile north. Not what you call a real huge town up here in the UP, but there's a fellow here who's been feeding deer. Bob Gardner just gave me the high sign to come on in, so we rolled the cameras and we're, we're going in through the house. He says the deer are right outside the picture window. 
We're gonna find out what the story is. Here we are. We got the cameras rolling. Is that okay? What is your name? Joe Delosky. Joe Delosky. Yeah, my glad wife, to meet Alice. You. Alice, glad to meet you, Alice. Well, where are they, Bob? They're... Oh, yeah, here they are. Can you see them there, OJ? Just go ahead and step right up there a little ways. Can, can they see inside the picture window here? Can they see inside? Yeah, the yeah they can see it. Sure. They oh, see look. motions and... Okay, well, come on up here. We'll get, we'll get right behind the camera. Well, there's three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many have you had here at once? Well, between 25 and 30 at one time. Wow. Are they in good shape this year, or are they hurting? Well, they're not, not this bunch isn't hurting, but no. the DNR said they are. Yeah, t so you get 25 or 30 here. I, I heard that uh, just in town there, they had five deer hit on the highway. I don't know how many there is, no, seven or eight. Seven or eight? No. Yeah, we've seen the road kills along the way coming uh -huh. up here. Yeah, they, uh, well, they get about five or six kills, and then they found one dead one over here back of this other friend's house. Mm-hmm. Well, how much money do you, you put into deer feeding during the winter? Oh, not too much. Not too much? No, we get uh, lettuce and other produce scraps from Hub Super Value and, <coughs> and Munising and IGA. Friends bring apples. And we buy hay, and then a lot of people had a lot of apples this fall, you know, from abundance of... How, how much well. during, the, during the day are they out here? Look at that one with their ears back. Oh, she just kicked a little bit <coughs> right there. There's deer out here all the time. But the greatest amount come in the morning, about 7.38 when I first feed them. The deer, we even observed in the short time we were there, the deer do a lot of fighting among mm -hmm. themselves, a surprising amount, driving each other away with their hooves and ears back. This is a typical situation, especially uh, when deer are hungry. There's a, what we call a dominance, dominance hierarchy. And it's usually, uh, it's like a pecking order in chickens or in other animals that the the biggest, uh, the strongest animal will dominate everybody else. And normally they, they understand this and they have it all worked out so they get along amicably. But when it's a situation of, of a short food supply, then that situation tends to break down and some of the younger, smaller deer try to get in there and get a mouthful and they get kicked for their efforts. Mm -hmm. how, how far away are these deer where they bed down and so on? Do you know? Have any idea? Right now? Mm -hmm. Tell them how close they've been. Well, uh, the last three nights, one has bed right out here where they're eating. I get up right? at six in the morning and I'd see them laying there yet. But they're all in, they're just all in through back here. How far, how wide an area do these deer come from, do you think? To, to feed there right in the back of their backyard? Well, they're probably within a half mile or so. This is where they spend the winter. Uh, in the springtime, of course, they're gone and they may leave and uh, travel 25, 30 miles. We, we know that from our Ooh, tagging studies. Far. That, uh, yeah, so the distance, the movement from summer to winter range is traditional. They'll uh, they keep coming back to the same yard in which the mother took them the first year and they may come back for 10, 12 years or until they die. And in the springtime, then the mother leads them out to where she spent the, her first summer, mm -hmm. and the fawn then will, will do the same thing, and, and their progeny will, will keep going back to the same area. And uh, this is uh, ingrained in them, and it's uh, quite traditional, and it shouldn't come as any surprise. Some deer, of course, don't go nearly as far, but uh, the, the summer range makes up about uh, uh, the, the vast portion of their total area. The, the winter yard is only about 10% of the whole, the whole area that they normally occupy. Well, you know, all of the people who have been on Michigan Outdoors on tonight's show uh, are going to become members of the Michigan Outdoors Club. We make you complimentary members, and there's your Club Good. Digest. And Alice, we have some venison recipes in here. Well, maybe if Joe can read the recipes, he can cook his own venison from now <laughs> <Well>, on. <laughs> well, since you've been feeding the deer, you don't you lost your appetite for venison? Well, that's the first time I pushed it away. It was two weeks ago when we were having venison. And that's because you've been feeding him and grown sort of that attached close. to him? That close, uh-huh. What about you, Joe? No, I'll still hunt. Still, still go at it. Oh, yes. I'll go with it. Well, I don't think that there's any conflict between a hunter feeding deer and oh, no. seeing how beautiful they are. Yeah, I like to bring them through the winter anyway. And they're close. And she's enjoyable. Mm-hmm. And it don't cost that much. Well, it was quite an afternoon there seeing all those deer. 
And I think we hunters, we, we think the most beautiful animals in the world are the game that we pursue. They are skittish, but I guess when the thaw comes and they're in better condition, then they'll they'll really be skittish. They'll be gone and quickly, according to the Dalaskis. Yeah, well, it was interesting talking to the Dalaskis and Lou Verm, also from Cousineau. We're going to have some more uh, discussion with him in future shows about the deer herd up there in the UP. Quite an afternoon. Well, heading north to Munising, we thought we'd get maybe some beautiful shots of Lake Superior, but... The, what happens uh, in conditions like this, it gets foggy when you get near the water. It was a proverbial change between night and day. It sure was. We can see the snow here in Munising. They said that this was about half what there was a week or two ago, just because of the melt and the spring thaw we had. But we did get one shot of a foggy Lake Superior. There are shanties out there. Uh, people, I guess, have been really doing well on whitefish. Yes, they have. They, uh, in fact, better than they've done in some time from, from the information we got. So we were, we were really keyed up. What we're looking at here is some Upper Peninsula Ingenuity. Well, sort of Ingenuity. <laughs> you, you left your regular string at home, buddy. That's right. Yeah. I ordinarily use string for this purpose. But, uh, and what are you doing? Explain to the Okay. Folks. I'm tying my trousers down tight to the tops of my boots so the snow doesn't get up underneath them and into the tops of my boots. The snow was not expected. Yesterday we were talking spring in yeah. the UP, early spring. Beautiful. It was spring-like. Yeah. Well, this is Buddy Jacobs. Degrees. Buddy Jacobs, fish biologist up here for the south western part of the UP? Yes, that's right. And we're going to go fishing on Hagerman Lake and catch what? Northern pike. Lots of them. Guaranteed? As close as I can come to guaranteeing. <laughs> We've heard that before, buddy. Bob Garner and I are still here in the UP. The weather has changed dramatically, but we're going to go fishing. So let's go. Bud, you got, is it moving, still moving? No? Okay, go right ahead and do whatever you, you got to do. Was it moving quite a bit there? It, uh, yeah, it moved. It took out uh, 15, 20 feet of line while we're watching. Okay. Okay. Okay, now you're going to tighten that down. Yeah. Feel the fish. I hope I feel the fish. Yeah, he's there. Okay. Yeah. Now what I'm going to set do? the hook right now. Oh, I think I lost him. I did. Oh. Yeah, just it's the middle. That's all it's feeling. Okay. Oh, That's it. God. Yeah, he's scarred up pretty good. Think, uh, yeah. think the pike will come back for him? I think so, yeah. Okay. This is uh, 17 feet of water here. Five, ten. Good place, right, right on a, right on a break. Then yeah, it is. It, it's shallower, uh, just, just beside of us here. Okay. Now you got that. We got 17 feet of water here. Now, how deep are you setting it? About 12 feet. About 12 feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, get it back down to the hole. We'll try it again. Well, Bob, we tried. <laughs> we, we tried on the tip-ups. They didn't. Uh, we had another flag out. too, but we, okay. we didn't hook. There was nobody else fishing that afternoon. Uh, the weather did turn for the worse, but you were in the red shanty there, I was in the green shanty, and we're turning our attention towards spearing pike, thinking maybe that'll do it. I have been sitting in this shanty for four hours, and I haven't even stood up yet. And I must admit, I nodded off a few times, but if you want to come in and see what this is like, come on and open the door. You can go ahead and open that. Now, what you see hanging across here is a cloth that helps keep it dark and keep the wind out, and I'm going to stuff this right up here so you can see inside. This is not real big. I'm going to stand up. Oh, <laughs> that feels good. I can stand all the way up to the top and sometimes I imagine I should do that a little more often so I can just stretch. But in here, it's quite warm. I've taken my snowmobile suit down around my waist and we have right here a gas heater, which is quite warm and I can take it and, and turn it down and turn it up depending. Sometimes it does get a little a little too hot in here almost. There's some shelves, have some corn borers and some grubs here for, for some panfish if they come through. Put my coat back here. And here's the fishing end. Now this hole that is cut in here is not a round hole, it's rectangular. It's about, oh, two feet by three feet or so. What I have down here is a decoy. You've maybe seen these and wondered what they are. People have asked me oftentimes in antique sales. This is a decoy that will attract the pike, hopefully, to come in. It's white, shows up very well, and it's on a, just a line that is attached to a reel. If you can see these reels right up here. The only purpose of this is uh, just to 
get the decoy down all oh, about halfway to the bottom. Now there's another reel here with a line on it. And what we have here is a live decoy. This is a live sucker minnow. I mean, it's not a minnow, it's a live sucker. Look at the size of that. A lot of times, a lot of fish we catch are smaller than this and we call them keepers. This is bait. And it's swimming down around there, trying to attract a pike. Now, we don't, we're not planning on catching a pike with that. What I have here is the spear ready to go. And this is a pike type of spear. And if a pike comes down, I'll stick the tines in the water, maybe down about a foot or so, and thrust it down and hopefully spear the pike. I also have right here, kind of cumbersome to do this holding the microphone, but I have a pan fishing outfit. And on the end of this, I have a little corn borer or grub right there. And I sit and watch that. I had one bluegill come through the hole. But I sit and watch all of these things. Every now and then I jiggle the sucker minnow. In fact, if you want to come in here, I'll show you what I've been looking at for the past four hours. Okay, this decoy I look at gives me something to look at down through the hole here. And the way I get some motion to it to maybe attract fish, just pull it straight up in the air. And it curves around in a circle like that. So that gives me something to do right there. The other thing is I have over here this... This rod right here with a little grub on it. You can see I'm bringing it up next to the decoy right now. That's in case a panfish comes through. I'll be ready for that. And the other thing, of course, is my big sucker right here. You can see it. Sometimes he'll be motionless and just sit down there. So I just give him a little tug and he starts swimming. Now he every now and then wraps around the decoy line. But his job is just to attract a pike so I can get the spear out. Maybe spear it. A 23-pounder taken here last week. That's something to think about. But this is quiet. It's interesting. I can see crawdads down on the bottom. Bluegill move through. Today's kind of a slow day, but it's different. So this is what I have spent, actually, the last six hours doing. I haven't seen anything, but I tell you, this day has been a little different. We're going to run over and find out what the scoop is from our fish biologist who brought us here, Buddy Jacobs, and see what Bob Garner has been doing. I think it's kind of nippy outside, so I'm going to... It, it actually, the temperature isn't that cold yet, but the snow we've gotten has been incredible. Put my mittens on. Here we go. Now let's go over and see what they've been doing. We have some tip-out pups set up out here, which they check periodically. You know, sometimes when the wind's blowing, it's almost hard to, to breathe when you first get out in it. But look at this snow. None of the snow was here yesterday, so they tell us. We probably should have done our ice fishing yesterday. Hey, fellas. Yeah. What's going on? We got the cameras rolling. Is that right? Yeah, and I just showed the people here what I was doing next door for the past six hours. Come on out here. Okay. Well, what does Bob have his hand on the spear for? He thinks there's going to be a pike come in. No. Moment you think so? Yeah. Our spear, the host of Michigan Outdoors. One of <laughs> yeah. Well, how's it been? And what's the reason it's been this way? <laughs> it has been slow. And the reason it's been slow is on a kind of I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps it is this front that's coming through. I, mm -hmm. I'm at a loss. I really expected it to be much better than it has been. Well, some people say the barometric pressure might yeah. even affect fish yeah. through the ice. I think so. How's that? 30 years or so as a fish biologist? And I don't know for sure. You don't know for sure. <laughs> well, that's honest, but you do well quite a bit of the time. We're going to be coming up to this neck of the woods again. Good. I but, hope so. Yeah, I this spring. So. We'll one more chance. chance. Well, well, not one more chance. We're going to come up to the UP regularly, right, Bob? Yeah, I hear the walleye fishing, the conservation officers we talked to, so the walleye fishing is fantastic. And get up and bob for some lake trout. Sounds like a lot of fun. Well, we've been sturgeon spearing at Black Lake. We've seen some deer through different parts of the UP, and we've come out fishing here, and we've seen a big change in the weather. Yes, we have. Well, now why don't we go back down with Ed Groves and find out what's happening this weekend on the outdoor calendar. I don't see how anybody can think that this is anything but scrumptious, Kathy. Oh, looks I think good. Bob is going to love it. We have on a bed of white rice, this upper peninsula venison pepper steak garnished with some parsley and a slice of orange. I'm going to take this over to Bob right now. I know <laughs> you can't wait uh -huh. for this. No, no, I can't. Okay. This recipe uh, came from Kay Ritchie's book, Savor the Wild, and it's uh, contributed by Richard P. Smith. 
Upper Peninsula Outdoor Writer. I think he's gonna love it. I really do. <laughs> Kathy, let's show the folks out there how we prepared this from, this looks like venison round. It is. Okay, and we just- It's really easy, too. Make some thin slices. Uh -huh. Browning I think, butter. I think Rich Smith has a winner there with this recipe. Oh, I do, too. So, browning it in butter. Now, remember, with venison, don't cook it very long. Right. Four to five minutes maximum for pieces of meat that size. Onions, how many? Why don't we toss Just a couple, a couple more? slices. Okay, and I'll couple put a couple more green pepper. peppers. This is a good take long. No, it browns for, like I said, we're going to cut it short right here for the cameras. Meanwhile, while, while this is cooking, you can get your rice on. We did a... Uh, just some, this was quick instant rice. Right, right. And it took about a minute. Oh boy, you need but that. That can be cooking. Consume right now. Now, this, Rich recommends adding a can or two, depending on how much pepper steak you have in there. Yeah, this is good. very simple. Notice, no wines, no sour cream, no mushrooms, no spices. Just simple. No garlic, salt, no oregano. We put the consomme in there and then add a couple tomatoes just before you serve it. And that's what we did. That's it. It didn't cook much longer than we no, had it cooking didn't. here. Let's turn the burner down a little bit, Kath. And we'll go over and check with Bob to see how he likes it. What do you think, Bob? <laughs> oh, this, this is the best one so far. <laughs> <The best> one. <laughs> this is a great recipe. Isn't that super? Yes. It's, it's so simple with no spices. Would you prefer any spices in it? Yeah, I would, as a matter of fact. And you know what would be really kind of neat is to put a little red pepper or something like that red on pepper? it, kind of spice it up. Mushrooms. Uh, Mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, you can do it to your taste. You were talking, Kathy, before about walk. in a walk with mm -hmm. celery. Mm -hmm. Make the make the pieces a little smaller okay, and try well, it in a walk real quick. This is in our Club Digest here, which all viewers can get, and it's Upper Peninsula Pepper Steak from Richard P. Smith. Good stuff, huh? Good stuff. I, I differ on adding more spices. I'd put some black pepper on it, and that would be it. Yeah, well, I like the red pepper. That's, okay. That's Everybody has it doesn't own. need anything, though. It really no, doesn't need anything the way it is. It's great that way. Next week, Sturgeon Spearing with Clarence Archambault and his family. We've got a good segment up there on sturgeon. Uh, we'll have some wildlife some uh, questions and answers from viewers. A lot of stuff, right? Outdoor yeah. headlines. Enjoy this weekend. Enjoy the thaw. We'll see you next week on Michigan Outdoors. Well, this is what you call the ending, and I don't know where this is all going to end, but Bob Garner and Buddy Jacobs are trying to start the snowmobile. We finished up our ice fishing here in the UP, and look at the toboggan. This is what's happened during the afternoon that we've been fishing covered with snow. Now, I don't know whether we're going to get back soon or not because we're having trouble with the snowmobile, but I'll try to carry out this report. Here's a about a four-pound northern pike that Buddy speared yesterday, and our luck wasn't running too good. But if you remember yesterday when we were filming the deer, how nice it was, it was almost like a spring day. And that was the day that Buddy got this pike. But here we are, getting ready to go in the southern, southwestern part of the Upper Peninsula. What, what's, what's going on here, boys? Oh, I never really liked these machines anyway. I see. Will we ever return to Lower Michigan? Aha, I think so. We ready, guys? Almost. Well, I guess we made it. We're gonna be back.